Take your Bibles with me this morning. I would like for you to put a marker at Mark 10. Marker at Mark 10. <laughs> put a marker in Mark 10. Eventually we'll make our way towards that passage at the end of the sermon today. But let's start today in Psalms 139. Psalms 139. We're in a series talking about one. Last week we talked about one God, one Father. And we said that the definition of the word one is uh, it can represent a number in the English ne- uh, metric system, and we say that one would be the first number in the metric in the, in the metric system, <laughs> in the English system, and so uh, English standard system. So one number one. Uh, so another way you can define it. And by the way, when we say number one, we're actually defining that as first. And let me just say, God should be first, right? And He was the first. There was no other before Him, so that would make Him first. Uh, then we also said you can define the word one as uh, a word that means to unify. Uh, we would say it like this, we are, we plural are one, or we're becoming unified. Does that make sense? So it can represent unified. And then the third way we can define uh, this is, so uh, the number one being unified, and the third way is we could say it, that it represents a person, almost using it like a pronoun, you are one amazing person. Does that make sense? So you can, it can refer to a human being. You are one. And so last week we talked about God. God is all of those things. God is the u- ultimate unifier. He is unified. He says, let us make man in our, meaning, meaning he is unified. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is first. And then he's also the one. There is no one like him. You shall have no other gods before me. Uh, love the Lord your God. He is the one. So I want to just make sure you understand that's, that is who God is. Now, we don't really ever become the, the perfect one uh, unless it's through the perfect one. In other words, he's the one who actually creates in us to become that one. So I want to talk to you today. Last week was we have one God. Today I want to talk about you are one. You have the potential of being the one that God's called. And you are the one that he chose at the very beginning of all, uh, of all his plan. He has a plan for your life. So let's talk about us. So I've got three points today. Here's point number one. Uh, this, and I hope you'll catch this, so important. You are one unique individual. And I want to say, the reason I want to say that is, uh, I think that we have a perception of who God is, but oftentimes we don't have a perception of who God says that we are. And I want, to, I want you to understand, if you would understand you from his perspective, it would probably change your attitude about how you worship him, how you honor him, how you respect him. Because God has made you one unique individual. Uh, let, me, let me just talk about some things that make you a unique individual, okay? Uh, your DNA sequence, all right? Uh, your DNA sequence has over 3 billion letters in it. Now, we know that certain letters and certain parts of your DNA have to be beside each other, and those letters never change. But of the changes that are possible in, in a 3 billion a letter combination, there are 88 million different possibilities for the human. I, I just want to say, you're a unique individual. There is no one who's been created like you. Uh, let, me, let me go to a different thing. Let's talk about fingerprints for a moment. And I know we all know that you know, we have unique fingerprints, but I just want you to think about, what's the possibility of another person having the same fingerprint that you have. Now, I'm not talking about same fingerprint on all five fingers. I'm talking about just one of your fingerprints matching up with someone else's fingerprint, one. I mean, the the, the possibilities of that go up astronomically when you start saying how many of you have the two of the same fingerprints. But let's just say one fingerprint being the same in someone else. Do you know you have a one in 60 billion chance of having the same fingerprint as someone else? One in 60 billion. Now, that, that may not, uh, you may not quite grip what that says, but if I say it like this, uh, that is 60 billion is eight times more people than are on the planet right now. You're a unique individual. And if that doesn't blow your mind, think about this, 60 billion is four times more people than have ever been on the planet. I, I just want you to get this. You're a unique individual. Uh, okay, how about this? Have you ever thought about uh, 
what are the odds that you would ever be born? Why don't you think about that? I mean, I just have you ever thought about what would have happened if my dad did get with my mom and have me? And you know, and we get this false narrative where we think to ourselves, uh, well, I would have still had the same mom, but I just had a different father. No, it doesn't work that way. You wouldn't have been born if your dad hadn't gotten with your mom. You would I just want you to catch this. It's a miracle to even think that you're here. But let's, uh, again, some of you parents, when I finish this talk, may have to have a conversation with some of your children today. So if you didn't send them out. And they're probably of the age, it's time to start having the conversation. But just think about, again, j even if your mom and dad were going to find each other no matter what, just the odds of you getting together. Think about this. What's the odds that that one sperm would get with that ovum Okay, all I'm talking about is your mom and dad, all the people of the world, somehow found each other, and, and they made you. Okay, I, just think about it. What's the odds of that happening? Are you ready for this? Here's the odds of that happening. It's one in 400 trillion. Did you hear me? One in 400 trillion. <laughs> that makes you pretty unique. And if you can't get a grasp around that, and again, I, let me tell you, let me tell you what that does not take into account. Think about your mom's mom and dad. The odds of them getting together, I'm not even adding this in. I'm just talking about your mom and dad, and, and are y'all seeing that? But what about your mom and her parents getting together to make her, and then she would get with your father who would make you, and his parents who somehow by odds y'all see how big this could actually get that you're actually in existence today okay so just talk about one in 400 trillion because the number once you move beyond parents and start adding in grandparents the number goes up astronomically that you could ever be in existence there was a plan to have you here uh, so what 400 one in 400 trillion what does that look like if you were to take all the oceans of the world and group them together, okay? Uh, one big giant body of water, you take the square footage of all that, bo of that body of water, you were to take one life-saving ring, you know what I'm talking about, the little Coast Guard life-saving ring, and you throw that life-saving ring somewhere in the ocean. What are the odds that a turtle at a given moment will stick his head up through that ring out of the ocean? This, this, this ought to blow your mind. One in 700 trillion. Someone says it's a big ocean. Yeah, humanity's a big ocean. And you stuck your head up through the ring. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying to you? That this didn't happen by accident. You're here on purpose. God decided. Listen, is it possible for a man and a woman to make a mistake and do something they should not do? Yes. Is the child that's made from that a mistake? No. Are, are y'all hearing me? I'm just saying you are a unique individual. It's a God allowed you to be here. That ought to blow your mind. God, God said, I want you here. And, and what is the odds of this? I just want you to think God chose you to be here. That's amazing. Let me give you some verses of scripture about that. Psalm 139 verse 13 says, uh, for you, God, you formed my inward parts. Who formed them? God did. Uh, and and I'm, I'm going to show you in a minute where I, I really believe scientifically we can kind of show that this is true. You were formed and you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you for I am, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I want you to catch that. I'm, I'm talking about a guy who didn't even have modern science on his side, and he said, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm telling you, I read some articles this week about how we're made. Do you know that we now can watch the entire process uh, from conception all the way through birth? We can see it happen with the technology that we have today. And do you know what, what they know about this? They, they can tell you what happens at every single key moment. They can tell you what happens on day one, all the way through the entire nine-month process. But you know what they can't tell you? They can't tell you how it's happening. 
They, we do not know, even to this day, how that happens. Let me tell you why. Because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. I'm just going to say somewhere inside of you is written that God did this. Uh, my frame was not hidden from you. When, my, when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth, your eyes, well, if you don't catch the, anything else, catch this one thing. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. I want you to think about unformed substance. Let me say it another way. Before you were ever thought of. God already thought of you. For your eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in your book were written all the days that were ordain ordained for me. When I as yet there was not one of them. I wasn't, even, I wasn't even there, but you already, before I ever existed, you already decided my days. How precious also are your thoughts to me. Have you ever thought about that God thinks about you? Oh God, how vast is the sum of them. If I should count, he's talking about the thoughts God had towards you even before you were formed. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. <laughs> when I awake, I am still with you. Here, here's what the psalmist is saying. God has more thoughts about you than there is sand in the sea. And I'm not talking about more thoughts towards humanity. I'm talking about you individually because you're a unique individual and God made you and he formed you. You're a unique individual. That's, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? This ought to get us out of this fear thing and just realize God placed you where he placed you because he wanted you there. There's no accidents with God. Job 14 verse 5 says, You have decided the length of our lives. You know how many months we live and we are not given a minute longer. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible. God already knows how many, the number of your days will be. And, and nothing you do will add a minute to it. This is so encouraging to me, especially for a guy who does not like to exercise. You know what I'm talking about? Anyone with me on this? You people are, I'm exercising to add another minute to my life. No, you won't. Ha ha. <laughs> Keep on. <laughs> speed your heart up. Go ahead, speed it up. You only get so many beats, I'm just telling you. So my wife would argue, yeah, but it's about, you may not add one minute of your, to your life, but it's about the amount of health you'll have until you get there. So anyway, so, but I just want you to know you're a unique individual. That's what the Word says, and I believe it. You're, a, you're amazing. Um, you're a unique individual. Number two, you are one like your father. Now, I'm not talking about your earthly father. That would be real easy. That would be obvious that you would be one like your father. But I'm talking about that you are one like your heavenly father. Obviously, there's verses of Scripture. The Bible says in the book of Genesis, let us make man in our image. God made you in his image. I mean, when he says us and our, obviously, that's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he says we're unified, we're one, and let us unified make man like us. That God's a three-in-one and that's how you were made. You were made a three in one. You are body, soul, and spirit. That's how God made you. He formed you to be like him. No other a creature on earth is formed like God. No, one, no other creature is in the image of God. Uh, I, again, just think, just think with me. I want, you, I, want, I want to say something, and it may offend some of you. Are you all right with me offending you? Because I'm good at it. So, <laughs> you know, uh, as much as you would like, your dog and cat are not made like you. You, you are made as a vessel to contain the Spirit of God. And I promise you, cats don't have the Spirit of God. Amen? <laughs> I, I, again, I don't care if you're a dog lover, cat lover. I'm just going to be an equal offender. But, you know, I, here's what I want you to understand. Cats are not made. Dogs are not made. Animals are not made to contain the presence of God. When God made man, the Bible says he formed him out of the dust of the ground. And then he breathed life into his nostrils. Not one other creature got the breath of God into, into the vessel that God made. Only you had the potential of holding on to the Spirit of God. That's why the Bible says, and by the way, in that garden when they died, they died that day not physically, they died spiritually that day. They were, they were God made them a three in one, but that day when they died, they became a two in one. 
But then the Bible says that Jesus came later on. He's talking to Nicodemus and said, what must a man do? And Jesus says, you must be born again. Nicodemus says, how can I do that? Get back in my mother's uh, belly again? No, that's impossible. Jesus says, that which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Therefore, you must be born of the Spirit. Can get this? What God is saying is, uh, when man died in the garden, every time a child is born, they're born of two. But when, I, when they're born again, they're born again three. Back in my image again. This is an amazing thought. You are unique like your father. If you don't get that, let me, let me say it a different way to you. I, I've, really, I, I've really gotten into this DNA thing. Uh, anyone gone and gotten your DNA checked and everything to see where you're from, see what your heritage is? I, I did the 23andMe one. And uh, it's actually uh, Matt and Jen Rudolph that I saw they did. I was like, dude, I'm doing that. That is awesome. So I wanted to see what my heritage was. And, and I've got, you know, one day I've got some questions. I really do. When I get to heaven, I've got some questions. Because supposedly uh, in my family line, my great-grandfather's mother, which would be my great-great-grandmother, was 100% Native American Indian. One problem. I did 23 and me, and it says, there ain't no Native American Indian in you. So I got some questions. I got some explaining to do when we get to heaven. I'm just saying. <laughs> right? So, but it, I want you to think about this. Okay, so uh, I've got into this DNA thing, and so after I got mine back, I started talking to my uh, siblings, and I started talking to my mom about it, and so my mom decided to do it. Man, I'm so excited. Man, my mom did this because that's going to really help because my dad's not around anymore. He's in glory with the Lord. So I want to know how her DNA would match up with my DNA. Okay, think about this. Uh, think my dad, my mom, okay? Uh, how, what percentage of the DNA from my mom was transferred to me? Y'all ready for this? Just think about it. Your father, your mother. What percentage was transferred to me? What would you say? You know, 50%. Yeah, that's what most people say. <clears throat> One problem. My DNA didn't come back 50% from my mother. It came back 49.9%. <laughs> Mom's got some planning to do. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to doing some research on that because it kind of baffled me because I expected it to come back 50% my mom. And here's what I discovered when I started doing my research that you never get 50 from either person. <laughs> so I don't have my dad's DNA, but as I was researching this, it's just interesting. I probably would have been something like 49.9 and 49.9, which leaves two-tenths of 1%. You're going to have to figure out where that two-tenths of a percent came from. That when God says, I wrote eternity in their hearts, there's another father I, I want you to catch this. It's so amazing what God has done. This is incredible. I want you to know, not only are you unique, but you are one like your father. Uh, let, me, let me read this for you in Scripture. Isaiah 44, verse 24 says, God, your Redeemer, who shaped your life in your mother's womb. Who shaped it? God. Says, I am God. I made all that is with no help from you. I spread out the skies and laid out the earth. Amen. I'm pretty sure God's involved yeah. in you being here. Ecclesiastes 11.5, from the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, says this, Just as you do not know the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of a pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. This is Solomon who made this statement like 4,000 years ago. And he says, we don't know how bones are formed in the womb. Okay, I got news for you. Do you know, even to this day, we can talk about the process, we can talk about when it happens, but to this day, we still don't know exactly how. In fact, I was, I was, I was reading one medical journal about this, and this was what one, one uh, doctor said about this. He said, uh, the process of forming a child would be like uh, making a skyscraper out of no material and doing it in nine months. He's, and, then, and he finished by saying, it truly is miraculous. <laughs> Do you think? I, I just want you to get this. You're one like your father. You're here on purpose. And here's the third thing. You are designed with a purpose. God has a reason that you're here. Don't ever think it's just to take up space, breathe air. 
please hear me. I, I never believe that God has people on this planet just to breathe air. You have a purpose. God has a plan for your life. Let me give you some verses about that. Job 10, verse 8 says, Your hands fashioned and made me all together. And would you destroy me? Remember now that you have made me as clay. Well, I'm going to say something about that just real quick. Just I want you to have a thought. God made you like clay. Remember when you were a kid and you played in the mud? You played in the clay? You remember that? Okay, listen. You know how easy it is to play in the mud? It ain't nothing for God to play in the clay and to make something out of it. He says, you made me like clay. Verse 10, did, did you not pour, out, pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? By the way, that is really what he's doing is he's describing the process of how you were conceived. And I'm not going to go get graphic on you, but I just think it's interesting. Read it. It's in there. Clothed me with skin and flesh, knit me together, bones and sinew. You have granted me life and loving kindness, and your care has preserved my spirit. Okay, I want you to get that last verse. God gave you life. It was his loving kindness that gave you that life. And it's God who preserved your spirit. Okay, I want to say it a different way. It was God who made you a vessel where you could maintain and hold his spirit, where you could have a place where God could reside in your life. This is amazing. You want to know what your purpose is? This is real simple. Your purpose is to house God. Now listen, you can't house God if you don't know him. But God designed you from the very beginning with a plan that he would be in you and with you forever. It's incredible. And God doesn't make mistakes in the vessels that he allows to be created. Uh, listen, listen to this. This is, this is really a, a great verse. This is in Ecclesiastes. Again, Solomon saying this. And I, I want you to catch this first verse. Verse 11 of chapter 3 says, He has made everything appropriate in its time. There's another translation that I really like. That's in the New American Standard. But there's another translation that says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. I want, I want, to, I want to say this a different way for you. He made you beautiful. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. Stephen got excited when I did that. <laughs> do you realize, and I, I know some of us, we have such a poor self-image of ourselves, but do you know that when God made you, he thought to himself, this is a perfect vessel, a beautiful vessel to hold me. It's amazing. In fact, you ought to just turn to your neighbor right now and say, you are beautiful. Make sure it's your wife if she's here. <laughs> that's the truth. I'm not, I'm not, we're not just playing a game here. I'm saying to you, that's what God says. And by the way, do you realize that when you say what God says, God says, oh yeah, my people are not seeing what I see. Isn't that great? He has also set in eternity, set eternity Where? Let me say it another way, in your DNA. I just want you to know that in your DNA is written the code of God right up in there. there. God is all over your DNA. That's the reason why God says it's a fool who says there is no God, because in your DNA is written there's a code set eternity in your heart so that you know to look for God. The moment you're born, you're set on a path to try and find God because you're a vessel to maintain his presence. Yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and do good in one's lifetime. Best thing you'll ever do is learn to rejoice and do good in your lifetime. Again, you're never going to do that without the presence of God in your life. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor. Watch this. It is the gift of God. Your life, the path that God sets you on is a gift. And I know some of you are looking at the gift going, I want a different gift. I want their gift. I wish I had their life. I wish I had their problems. Here's the problem. If you were in those, you wouldn't be satisfied with those either. You're not even satisfied with what God has given you. And I want to say to you, we need to start embracing the gift of life that God has given us. You're a miracle. Walk in it. And then verse 14, I know that everything God does will remain forever. There's nothing to add to it. There's nothing to add to it. There's nothing to add. Some of you, some of you probably need to get that verse. 
feel like you need to get some kind of enhancement somewhere. Sorry, that just came out. You don't have to add anything to it. You're all right just like you are. You want to hear me. And there is nothing to take from it. You're perfect. For God has so worked that men should fear him. Psalm 40 verse 5 says, Many, Lord, my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you have planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would, they would be too many to declare. He says, it's just too many to declare if I could even speak about what you have done. It's amazing. Psalm 119 verse 73 says, with, with your very own hands, you formed me. Your very own hands. Now breathe your wisdom over me so that I can understand you. This would be a prayer that I wish every believer would pray. You ever been reading God's word, don't understand it? Here's a prayer to pray right here. Lord, I know you for me. Now would you breathe your life over me so that I can begin to understand you? Anyone want that? Watch this. Talking about his understanding. He's, he's looking to gain the understanding of God. And when they see me waiting, talking about everyone else, here's, think about this picture. Here's a guy who's saying, I don't understand you. I wish I could understand you. And then it goes, and when everyone else sees that I don't understand and I'm waiting to get understanding from you, get the picture. Expecting your word, those who fear you will take heart and be glad. Here's what they're saying. I didn't think he'd ever get it. But look at that. He got it. <laughs> I mean, I'm just going to say to you, you think sometimes, boy, we're so glad God made Pastor Mark so smart about the word. Let me just say to you, it ain't Mark. It's God. I, I want to say it's available for all of us. And listen, there will be people who will rejoice when you finally get it. Well, bless God, didn't think they'd ever get it, but they got it. Just saying to you, it's an amazing verse. Verse 75, I can see now. <laughs> you understand that? I can see now, God, that your decisions are sometimes right. Is that what it says? I'm going to say something about you. God's decision was always right about you. Your testing, can we say the testing is a struggle? Your struggles, your testing has taught me what's true and right. Don't ever avoid the struggle. Don't ever avoid the test because it's the test that will help reveal to you that it was God all along who got you through it. Oh, love me. And right now, hold me tight just the way you promised. Remember that vessel? That's who you are. Now comfort me so that I can live, really live, not just exist. That's where a lot of Christians are. They're just existing. But really live. Your revelation is the tune that I dance to. Okay. <clears throat> Some of you Baptists might struggle with that statement. That's right. God plays the tune for us to dance to. Come on. Some of you are like, might have to go there for. The teenagers are like, woohoo! <laughs> All right. Ephesians 2.10, New Testament verse says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand, before you're ever born, so that we would walk in them. Let me say it another way. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. He has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for you. Don't ever give up. Don't ever give in. God is with you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. You can trust him. He's a good God. He has a plan for your life and a purpose. Not to harm you, but to bless you. <laughs> You're a unique individual. You have a great father. <laughs> and I just want you to know, not only do you have a great father, but God has a purpose for your life. He has a designed purpose for your life. One more last, one more last verse. <clears throat> and when a pastor says that, what do they mean? One more passage. Okay. One more verse. Matthew 10, 29 says, we read this, one of these verses last week in the message, but I want you to get the context behind that verse we read. Matthew 10, 29 says, are not two sparrows sold for a cent? Let me say that. I'm bringing it into modern language. Obviously, a cent back then was worth way less than what our cent is worth today. But I'm bringing it into modern language. It would say this. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Did y'all catch that? 
The only problem with that is today, sparrows aren't even worth a penny. In fact, the last time I went someplace, I never even saw a sparrow for sale. Are y'all, in other words, they have less value in humanity today than they had in Jesus' day. Okay, so we're basically talking about something that has no value. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Are not two sparrows sold? Are not something that has no value? I'm just bringing the King Mark version. And yet, not one of those things that has no value will even fall to the ground apart from your father. In other words, when, when a sparrow hits the ground, falls to the ground, God saw in that very moment that sparrow hit the ground. Anyway, any of you ever have a, glass, uh, a house with a lot of glass, glass windows, glass doors, and you'd be standing there and all of a sudden you hear a thud and you look out and a bird's falling over it on the ground? You ever, you ever seen that? In that very moment, God's looking in that very spot. Next time that happens, run outside and go, I'm right here! <laughs> and your neighbors will go, that guy's crazy. I mean, it's just the thought that God is saying, I saw what happened. Okay, if that's true and God sees the sparrow, what about you? Watch this, and this is the verse we read last week. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. It's how much God cares about you. So he goes on to say, do not fear. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. If God knows all of that and he can see the sparrow hitting the ground, why would you ever be afraid? For you are of more value than many, many, many sparrows. I want to say it so you get this. God sees you as valuable. You're important to him. And then someone says, well, okay, what's God's design then? If that's really true of a whole humanity, what's God's design? Are you ready for this? Verse 32. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who's in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Okay, here's what I want you to know. God sees every one of you. He gives every one of you a free choice. You can choose him or you can choose to reject him. He still sees you. You can never escape the eyes of God. You can never escape the presence of God. Please hear me. But I'm going to tell you what the difference is. The difference is some of you are going to live out life being a two with no help. And the rest of us have decided, I need some help. And we're going to live a three with God in us, guiding our path and, guiding and having plans for our life. And here's my question. Do you want to keep living as a two and being all alone? Or do you want to live life as a three? I also want to say this. Many, many Christians, many, many Christians, are a three because having believed, the Bible says, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And many Christians have the third part of their life, but they won't embrace him. And I think one of the reasons we won't embrace him, and I'm talking about in our daily walk, for God, what do you want today? What do you want today? We will not embrace him because we still have a personal self-image problem. We don't know who we are. And what I'm saying is if you would learn who you are, knowing that he's a good God and has power all for you. This power is inside of you. This omnipotent, om omniscient, omnipresent God is in you. Why would I ever be afraid? Stop worrying about who you are and start realizing you've got him, you've got all you need. Let's embrace the presence of God in our life. I, I have a bad habit in my life. I ask Lisa this almost every day. I, ask, I go to her and I, I think I just bug her. I just bug her to death. And I always ask her this question, and I, you know, what are you doing today? What are you doing today? And, and she's, uh, if you know Lisa, she's a very, very bottom line person, so I don't get a long answer. You know, I don't, I don't fully understand you men who have wives who will tell you everything. My wife doesn't do that. So, so I say to her, you know, what are you doing today? She'll say, this is, this is her whole day, going to work. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like a lot of men, ladies? I'm just saying, all right, going to work. Uh, well, what are you going to do at work? Whatever has to be done. But I had this thought, I did that one day this week, and all of a sudden this thought just popped into my head. If we're living with an ever-present God, omnipotent God, omniscient God in us, why would we not go to him every day and say, what do you got planned today for us, God? What's your plans for my life today, God? Who are we going to run across today? Who do I have an opportunity to encourage today? Who do I have an opportunity to bless today? God, it's going to be a good day for you're with me. Amen?